Okay, so here is the part of lecture number two that wasn't recorded. Um, I'm teaching this to myself so that um, you have the recorded uh, version for your records. So we previously discussed the um, identity and the proper rotation operation as uh, symmetry operations. In addition to that, we also discussed the mirror planes. So the next operation is the inversion operation. And the inversion operation is carried out around an inversion center. So in this case, we have a point as the um, symmetry element. So what do we do when we do invert? We move every point of the object through the inversion center to the other side. That means that if we define the inversion center as the uh, point zero in our coordinate system, then any um, coordinate x, y, z is getting transformed into the coordinates minus x, minus y, and minus z. So here is one example how the inversion works. We have here an octahedral molecule with six different ligands. So we can, for instance, put ourselves on the atom one here. So if we carry out the inversion operation, then the atom one moves through the inversion center, which you see in the center of the molecule, to the other side and is now at the position of atom six. Now, if we carry out the inversion operation around atom six, then atom six moves through the inversion center to the other side and is now in the position of atom one. So effectively, atom six and atom one have swapped up their positions. Now, similar things also happen with the other atoms. So as we carry out the inversion operation with atom two and atom four, those swap up their positions. And as we carry out the inversion for the atoms three and atoms five, then these two also swap up their position. So any inversion has the property that we can, that when we carry it out even times, the identity each is reached. And that means that uh, every point in space is in its original um, position. So for instance, when we carry it out two times, we produce the identity. When we carry it out four times, we produce the identity six times and so forth. When we carry out the operation an odd number of times, then it's always as though the inversion was carried out only one time. So three times is effectively the same as one time, five times is effectively the same as one time. So the Schoenfli symbol for the inversion operation is I. The hermann magua symbol for the inversion operation is one bar. We will understand in a minute where this uh, formalism comes from. So the last um, symmetry operation to consider is the roto inversion, which is equivalent to the rotation reflections. So by convention, in the symmetry of molecules, we use the rotation reflection. When we uh, talk about extended solids, we usually use the roto inversion. However, <clears throat> both symmetry operations are equivalent. So any rotation reflection can be expressed by a rot roto inversion and vice versa. So what do we do in a rotation reflection? So as the name says, we first have to rotate and then we have to reflect. Only after we have uh, done both, the symmetry operation is complete. So the rotation is carried out around what is called an improper rotational axis. So this axis is called improper because after the rotation alone, the symmetry operation is not complete yet. Typically our object that we produce after the rotation only cannot be superimposed with its original form. We need the reflection um, in addition. So after we've carried out the improper rotation, we have to reflect, and in particular, we have to reflect 
at a mirror plane that stands perpendicular to the axis around which we have rotated. So for instance, the methane molecule illustrated here has an S4 rotation reflection. So the capital letter S is the Schoenfli symbol for rotation reflection, and the subscript 4 indicates the order of the improper axis, which is in this case a fourfold order. So we have to rotate around 90 degrees. So what uh, will happen as we carry out an S4 uh, improper rotation reflection with our methane molecule, you see that this methane molecule is four different hydrogen atoms. They are labeled H1, H2, H3, and H4. So as we rotate or reflect, we first rotate, and by convention, we rotate counterclockwise. That is actually also true for a proper rotation, whether we rotate properly or improperly by convention, we always rotate counterclockwise. So as we do this here, we rotate 90 degrees counterclockwise. So how do our atoms move? So our carbon atom doesn't move, but our hydrogen atoms move. So how do they move? So let's start with H4 here. So H4 points here out of the paper plane toward us. And after the rotation, it moves into the paper plane and points upward. So H3, which points to the back after the rotation, is in the paper plane and points downward. So H2, as we rotate counterclockwise, points now to the back. And H1, as we rotate 90 degrees counterclockwise, now points to the front. So you can see that after this rotation, the produced molecule cannot be superimposed with the original molecule. And that means that, well, we do not have a C4 axis here. Um, we only have an S4. We need to now reflect at a mirror plane perpendicular to that uh, C4 axis around which we have rotated. So our C4 axis was here. It was actually bisecting the angle between H1 and H2, as well as the angle between H3 and H4. Now let us see what happens as we reflect. So we can reflect H4 at the mirror plane, and then H4 is here at the other side. Um, H3 also moves to the other side. So both H4 and H3 are still in the paper plane. So what about H1 and H2? H2 moves through the mirror plane to the other side, still pointing to the back. And H1 moves here through that mirror plane to the other side and still points to the front. So now what we can see is that this molecule produced can be superimposed with the original molecule. And that means that our symmetry operation is complete and the produced molecule is indistinguishable from its original form. So now let us do a roto inversion and see what a roto inversion does. So um, the hermann magua symbol for the roto inversion indicates the order of the improper axis, which is in this case four. And we put a bar on top of the four to indicate that we invert in addition. When this formalism was invented, computers were not uh, known yet. So um, at that time, everything was done in handwriting. And it's easy in handwriting to put a bar on top of a number. So with computers, it's actually not so easy to do this. Therefore, in well modern times, you also write four bar like indicated here in parentheses. So you just write bar behind the four indicating that there is a bar on top of the four. That's just easier to write on a computer. So let us do the first step the rotation, so the rotation is identical to the rotation in the rotation reflection. And that means that as we start out 
with this methane molecule here and carry out the 90 degree rotation, we produce again this molecule, which is identical to this molecule, which we previously produced using the rotation reflection. However, now in the next step, we have to invert. And that means that we have to move all the hydrogen atoms through the inversion center, which is here in the center of the carbon atom to the other side. So let us do this. So H4 will move through the inversion center to the other side. H4 is in the paper plane and therefore after the inversion will still be in the paper plane. So it's here. So this H3 will move through the inversion center to the other side and therefore will still be in the paper plane. So H2, which points to the back, will move through the inversion center to the other side. And now it needs to point to the front. And H1 will move through the inversion center to the other side. And that means it will now point to the back. We see again that the molecule that we produce here can be superimposed with the original form. And therefore, we can say that the produced molecule is indistinguishable to its original form and the symmetry operation is complete. So now let us compare the two molecules that we have produced with the rotation reflection and the roto inversion respectively. You see that um, the molecules are actually not identical. H2 and H1 are being swapped up here and here respectively, and H3 and H4 also appear swapped up. So at first glance, it seems that the roto reflection and the roto inversion are actually not doing the same. But that's actually not true, and we understand that when we consider um, two properties of the rotation reflection and the rotation inversion respectively. So uh, when we look at a rotation reflection, then when n is equal to even, that means when the order of the improper rotational axis is even, then we need to rotate reflect n times to produce the identity. When we, uh, when n is odd, then we need to rotate reflect 2 n times to produce the identity. So for instance, when n is 4, then n is even. And that means that we have to rotate reflect 4 times to produce the identity. While for instance, when n is equal to 3, which is odd, then we have to rotate or reflect 6 times to produce the identity. So now, um, the thing is that um, an S41 operation, meaning that rotating and reflecting only one time is equal to carrying out three times the roto inversion and vice versa. So that means carrying out the rotation inversion only one time is equal to carrying out the rotation reflection three times. And that shows that to each rotation reflection, there is actually an identical rotation inversion in vice, and vice versa. And that means that um, roto inversion and rotation reflection are actually equivalent. They are doing effectively the same um, thing and we can use either of these. Okay, so this is now the um, end of this part of the lecture. We have covered all the other slides already in a recorded version. So I just stop the recording here and stop the lecture and you will find the lecture part on Corsite.